Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. I'm Kaz Nelson. I'm the Vice Chair for Education. And it's my pleasure today to introduce one of our stellar fellows today, Dr. Claudia Camposoria. I'll share with you a little bit about Claudia's background. She graduated from San Diego State University with a major in biology and Spanish literature. She then went on to the University of Alabama in Birmingham for her master's degree in science in neuro neurobiology and biophysics. She went on to medical school at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, completed residency in our residency program, and I had the pleasure of being her program director for three years before she went on to the Child and Adolescent Fellowship in the Department of Psychiatry. So she has this really broad and rich background in biology, neurobiology, medicine, and psychiatry. But beyond that, she shared with me that she has this wonderful uh, background in working with minority populations, including Latino populations during college and volunteering with the Flying Samaritans in Tijuana, Mexico to provide services as a medical interpreter for the Westside Clinic in St. Paul in Minnesota during medical school. She's also published a comprehensive parent-directed Spanish manual with the University of California, San Diego Mother and Child Center to educate parents of children with HIV about the role of specific HIV medications and their potential side effects. During medical school, she also developed a medical student interest group, Café con Leche, to teach medical Spanish terminology to fellow medical students that were interested in working with the Latino underserved population. So we're so pleased that she brings this inner section of cultural expertise and working with minority populations into psychiatric care for our patients in our community. And I'm thrilled that you're going to be talking to us on this topic today. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, can you hear me? Pretty okay? Yeah? Okay. So, sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize that I sound really hoarse. <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to talk to you about mental health in the Latino community. Um, I feel like that's an important topic, especially in Minnesota, where this population, in the last nine years that I've been here, my subjective opinion is that it's been growing tremendously. Um, I was mentioning earlier how everywhere I turn now, I hear somebody speaking Spanish, and I think it's, um, it's definitely a cultural shift for the Midwest, especially here in Minneapolis. So. Um, with that, I don't, my disclosure information is I don't have any financial relationships that I'm going to disclose, and I'm not going to discuss any label use or investigational use in my presentation of any medications or such. So I wanted to just present to you my objectives of what um, I wanted to talk about today and cover, and one of them is understanding bicultural stress um, that's present within the community factors that contribute to psychological vulnerability among Latino youth, and mental health interventions that can improve Latino youth prospects of attaining a healthy life. So with that, I wanted to start with some demographics of what Latinos look like throughout the nation, and then ultimately here in Minnesota as well. So um, in this slide, it shows you, um, this is from the Pew Research Center, so it's based off CDC um, uh, surveys. And it shows that approximately one-third, or about 17.9 million, of the nation's Hispanic population is younger than 18. I don't know if I have a little pointer here. Oh, maybe here. Oh, wait. Um, does this work? No. I don't know what's going on. Um, oh, maybe here. I was trying to, but I couldn't. Get it to work. Okay, anyways, um, it's not that important. So it's younger than 18, as you can see um, on the uh, brown part of the top of the graph. That's the Hispanic uh, portion. Um, and about a quarter or 14.6 million of all, of all Hispanics are millennials. So millennials, it's considered um, ages 18 to 33 um, within the year 2014. Uh, by comparison, half of the black population and 46% of the U.S. Asian population are millennials or younger. So among whites, the nation's oldest racial group, which is the oldest racial group in the nation, only about four in 10 are millennials or younger, which is about 39%. So you can see that within the Hispanic population, um, younger than 18 is a pretty big uh, age range compared to the others, and it's the largest one within um, other ethnocultural groups. 
So in this slide, um, what, what it's showing you is the median age of um, different races that are comprised here in the United States. And so uh, the nation's Latino population has long been one of its youngest. In 2014, the most recent year for which data is available at this time, the median age of Hispanics is approximately 28 years old, uh, which is well below that of the major racial groups and has been so since at least the 1980s. But as with the nation's population overall, uh, the Hispanic population's median age has steadily risen since the 80s, from 22 to now 28 um, in 2014. A significant change, through still, though still the smallest increase in median age among ma any major racial or ethnic group during that time period. For example, the median age among whites was 43 in 2014, uh, up 12 years since the end of the year. Agents, the median age is uh, the median age was 36, up eight years since 1980. Uh, and for blacks, the median age, as you can see, is 33. So we're still pretty um, young, but the population that's growing is pretty young also. <clears throat> so here, um, what we're seeing is the median age of immigrant Hispanics. Um, so the median age among foreign-born Latinos is more than 20 years that of U.S.-born Latinos, which is 41 and 19, respectively, while the median age of foreign-born Latinos has risen, risen dramatically over the past three decades from 31 years in 1980. The median age of U.S.-born Latinos has not changed significantly. Much of this change in the median age group uh, among foreign-born Latinos reflects the slowdown of migration from Latin America that has occurred since 2007. Without a new large wave of younger immigrants coming in, those Latino immigrants who remain in the U.S. have aged, pushing up the group's median age total. <clears throat> so, because so few children come to the U.S. as immigrants, young Hispanics are overwhelmingly U.S. born. Among children younger than 18, 94% are U.S. born, uh, and about two-thirds of Hispanic millennials, which is about 65%, were born in the United States. This compares with about 40% of Generation Xers, Boomers, and older adults who are U.S. born. So our youngest group is still pretty young, younger than 18 within the United States. So um, continue with demographics, a higher U.S. born share comes, uh, comes with a larger share who are proficient in English. Um, so about three quarters of Hispanic millennials are proficient uh, English speakers. That is, they either speak only English at home, which is 28%, or speak a language other than English at home, but speak English very well, which is 48%. So that's that far um, second to uh, second to the right, I suppose, the far or the far left, second one. Um, some 19% of Hispanic millennials speak English less than very well, and just 5% do not speak English at all. Uh, that's in comparison to the Hispanics between the age group of 5 to 17, nearly all who are U.S. born. 88% are proficient English speakers, including 37% who speak only English at home, and 50% who speak another language at home but speak English very well. Which gives me a little bit of hope for my children, <laughs> because I've, at least 50% or 87% uh, was a little bit like, oh, okay, I can still, my kids still might speak Spanish. <laughs> While English language proficiency is more common among younger generations of Hispanics, speaking Spanish in the home is less common. Overall, some 62% of Hispanics ages 5 to 17 and 72% Hispanic millennials speak Spanish at home. So there is still, um, what this, to me what this means is that um, there's still a, a, quite a large amount of people that still, that speak both Spanish at home and English, and they're proficient in English, but there's also that, that, that cultural tie to the language. And so that's what that's showing me, that even at younger age groups, that cultural tie still remains. So in Minnesota, uh, the percent of Minnesota's population that is non-white or Latino is predicted to grow from 14% in 2005 to 25% in 2035. The numbers of Latino, Black, and Asian minorities, Minnesotans, sorry, are projected to more than double over the next 30 years. Latino population is projected to rise rapidly, growing from an estimated 196,300 in 2005 to 324,400 in 2015 to 551,600 in 2035. 
About two-thirds of the total, pop total Latino population are projected to live in the seven county Twin Cities area by 2035. So the graph on the right is basically a 2014 graph of showing you the demographics. And as you can see, the larger, the, the green areas are where um, more of the concentration of, of Latinos live. And that, that makes sense to me because a lot of Latinos are um, usually workers of, of lower paying jobs that have to do with farming and agriculture. That's their expertise of where they come from in their countries. Um, so it's no surprise to me that they're aggregated in those in those specific areas that I, I've never been to those areas, but what I hear is that there's a lot of farm over there and horses and cows and things like that, which is makes sense. Um, so uh, this is a comparison of uh, native born Hispanics, so US born adults versus children. So following, the, so following the national data as a group, Hispanics are much younger than Minnesotans' uh, overall population, and an increasing share are native-born. The number of Hispanic children in Minnesota has quintupled since 1990, and Hispanic children now comprise 8% of Minnesota's uh, under-18 population. The median age of Hispanic residents is 24 compared to 38 for Minnesota overall. 62% of Minnesota's Hispanic residents are native-born, and 91% Hispanic children are under, under age 18 are native-born. About half of native-born Hispanic children have parents who are immigrants. So um, that's important because uh, that tells you that there's some, um, well, what's important is that there's that half of these kids who are born in the United States have at least one parent who's an immigrant, which tells you about um, the cultural, not only cultural tie, but the influence and how that um, causes some, which we're gonna talk about, some bicultural stress within the family. Sorry, I'm going to drink some water. <clears throat> so, um, so those factors also tie into education. So, uh, in similar to the nation, high school graduation rates for Minnesota's Hispanic students have climbed over the last decade. On-time graduation rates in Minnesota rose from 33% to 58%, but remained well below the overall state average of 80%. Just 16% of Minnesota's Hispanic population aged 25 and older have a bachelor's degree compared to 33% of Minnesota's overall population. So this is a slide about um, the, the proportion of jobs. So as you can see, um, this is again an ethnic, ethnic breakdown of um, employment within Minnesota up to 2012. And a high proportion of Hispanic adults are working but earn below average. So they're pretty in proportion to Asians um, and their white counterparts. But 71% of Hispanic adults in Minnesota are working, which is the highest, the sixth highest percentage in the nation, but still 5% points below the share of all adults um, in Minnesota who are working, which is usually 76%. On average, Hispanics fare far worse when they get their paychecks. The median income of a household is about $18,000, less than that than the overall state median household income. And about one in four Hispanic residents live in poverty more than double the poverty rate for all Minnesotans. So they're, with that poverty rate, even though they're working and they're employed, um, you know, comes health insurance, comes uh, still living under the poverty line, and then comes risk factors for the young, adult, for the young uh, adolescents um, within the community. So um, what do all the statistics mean, right? It gives us an overall encompassing view, but what really does it mean for the, for the Latino youth and for the adolescents? Um, and I think a bigger question are what are the main factors that contribute to psychological vulnerability among Latino youth? Most risk factors stem from the social and environmental context within, within which a majority of Latinos reside. So over half of the Latinos uh, kids under age 18 live in families where at least one parent is, is an immigrant, with parents who struggle at low wage jobs and, and unstable jobs, and in some cases are either undocumented or have been deported. And then we have other factors, which is high proportion of adults working but earning below average, um, and limited English proficiency and or immigration status, uh, which is a barrier to receiving social services. Even though the, the kid might be, as we noticed from our statistics, that the kids might be proficient in English, but um, the parent uh, is, the, is the person who um, accepts that, that help and if they don't have any cultural understanding of that or if they don't understand what is even going on because they don't understand English, then that child is likely not gonna receive the care anyways, even though they are proficient in English. So, um, 
So how does this affect the patient, parents' mental health? So, uh, or these, these factors, how do they affect it? So reduced contact with youth, um, they, they become uh, depressed, you know? So especially with high proportion of adults working but earning below average, many of them have to have multiple jobs. And so that causes some strain, some um, being out of the house more often, and sometimes uh, that can lead into depression for the parent. And um, even though I'm not going to go into this, there was a study that recently came out from Sweden that showed that um, parents who suffer depression tend to have kids that have lower functioning at school. Like, even though the children are not depressed, um, the children are affected by uh, not being able to uh, function to their capacity, and they actually drop uh, educational points um, at, with, uh, as, the pre as the parent is depressed. Another one is invalidating interactions with youth. Um, so invalidating interactions could be like, you know, uh, why are you depressed? You know, why are you sad? Uh, you have nothing to be sad about. You've got a roof over your head. You've got food. You know, I'm the one who's struggling. So kind of invalidating how the, how the, how the adolescent would, is feeling about themselves or about their, about their situation. And broken families, one or more parents are not available for youth. Like we mentioned, deportation, not having enough income, therefore having multiple jobs and having to be out, the house, out of the house. And so the child is ended up, ends up being raised basically by themselves in a house, in an empty house or with other siblings, and being the caretaker sometimes for those siblings, which we'll get to also. And then um, here we notice uh, how this affects the mental health of the youth. So. They don't graduate on time because they get poor grades. They um, have to help out, help in the home either by, like I mentioned, taking care of the siblings or actually even working sometimes to support the family. Um, this leads to a reduced connection to family ties and uh, par parentification, parentification <laughs> that's how you say it, of youth. So now the, now the child is the one that becomes the mom and the dad because mom and dad either are not around or, um, or limit, they're not, their time is very limited when they're at home. And then there's this, what I call, immigration guilt. So, um, so there's this expectation that uh, you're supposed to be better than me. You're supposed to attain something better than what I did. And if you don't, then you're a failure. You know? And so I think that sort of uh, ties into um, some of the mental health that we see, too, that the expectation is there. And if you can't meet that expectation, then then you feel an, an, a guilt about it and that you can't move your family forward. Um, and then trauma. So a lot of these kids, when they're left at home alone or they're left um, in vulnerable situations, they can get physically, sexually abused, and that leads to a constellation of other events that occur. And then bullying at school and at home. So this is very interesting because um, uh, what I have found is that so I don't know if everybody's heard about reverse discrimination. So this is kind of, in my head, like reverse discrimination, where um, if you look white and you're blonde and green-eyed, which there's a lot of um, Mexicans that look like that, you're not Mexican enough to the Mexican people. And if you don't speak their way, you're not Mexican enough or you're not Latino enough. And so that's sort of like, um, and so the kids get bullied. And a perfect example of this is uh, recently, um, I'm currently on 4A in the, um, in the uh, uh, subacute unit. And there was a girl who, um, whose parents were born in the United States. She was born in the United States. She had a very um, uh, traditional name, actually. It's, it's an indigenous name. And when I saw her, I have to say that I didn't even expect what I saw. She looked white, you know? And so, um, and so she was telling me, when I spoke to the parents to kind of get the idea of what was going on with her, they said, you know, we were born here, but mom, her, my, uh, her, dad, her dad and her mom are very um, Mexican, meaning like they, they, they uphold the traditions at home, um, they try to uh, eat the Mexican traditional foods, and they try to uphold their culture. Um, the only thing that they don't do is they don't speak Spanish at home. Um, I don't think they know, they know Spanish, but other than that, they're very Mexican, he said. This is a father's report. Um, and then the kid told me that the, that the parents are so involved in Mexican culture that they, like, their community is West St. Paul. And so, and in that community, it tends to be a very, very tight community. And so they all know each other. And then there were some family dynamics that happened, and the kid got stressed out and ended up in the unit. And so, um, and so because everybody knows everybody in that community, um, she gets bullied because uh, people tell her, you're not, you're not Mexican enough. You don't look Mexican. You know, why do you even say you're Mexican? You must be lying, you know? And yet at home, 
she's, she has to be Mexican, right? And so it's this dichotomy of like a push and pull of culturation. So, um, and then of course bullying at school because you look different and you're not, you know, you're, you're not white. <laughs> so you don't win either way, it seems like. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention how this is a circle. And so the circle is that if the parents are not healthy, then the kid likely is not going to be healthy. And so, um, and this then uh, leads to what I was just saying about bullying at home, that, you know, you're not following the standards, you're not following the traditions, um, you're, not, you're, be, you're becoming white, and that's a bullying of, like, a constant bullying of home and at school, so they get at both ends sometimes. Okay, so... Uh, this is, um, these are uh, statistics that came from a youth risk behavioral surveillance system. So this is a, a, like a, a survey that's provided to, um, to high school uh, students, 9 to 12 years old, um, throughout the U.S., and it's a CDC-based uh, um, survey. And uh, it summarizes uh, results for 104 health risk behaviors, plus, uh, including obesity, overweight, and asthma. And this is a 2013. I try to get 2014 because it always published a year behind. I couldn't get it, so I'm sorry, but I, I really tried. Um, so 42 state surveys, and, and actually Minnesota isn't surveyed. Don't ask me why. It's just it, wasn't, it's doesn't, it doesn't ever get surveyed. So it's not part of these 42 states. And, um, 20, and it's based on 21 large urban school district surveys conducted among students in grades 9 to 12. So as you can see here, um, I think it's pretty obvious that um, they ask you these questions about uh, risk behaviors. So in the last 12 months, have you had thoughts of suicide, uh, made suicide plans, attempted suicide, or gotten medical attention for suicide? And so then they break it down through ethno, uh, ethno cultural, eth ethno ethnic ethnicities. And so in the um, total U.S. is the last column. And Hispanics uh, tend to be higher than the national average and higher uh, except for gotten medical attention for suicide attempts. Oh, no, that is higher, too. They're higher for all the four, um, for, for, for the four categories in the risk behaviors. So, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. So, um, so that's interesting, right? Like, does that mean blacks don't have adversity? No, they have adversity, you know? So why is it that Hispanics are such have, have a higher percentage than, than other, other peer groups and within the total US? So then they took this a little further and they broke it down in between males and female Latinos. And so I put in Latino males. There hasn't been a lot of research done for Latino males, which is surprising. It's mostly all done in, in Latino female, Latina females. But they broke it down again amongst uh, peer groups of females, and I just added the males so that we could see in comparison to the Latina females how it, how it fares out. But as you could see, Latina females, even within that group, they tend to be much higher than their counterparts, and up to 26% um, of thoughts of suicide, which is quite different from um, black males and white females. So all of these are pretty significant. <clears throat> Um, so studies have shown consistently since uh, the 19, since uh, 1995 that Hispanic adolescent females have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and behavior, but not deaths, than black or white female counterparts. The, of note, the YRBS is administered to as adolescents that are attending school, but does not include those who have dropped out and may be at higher risk. Additional uh, YRBSS only ask about a 12-month prevalence, possibly under underestimating the overall prevalence of uh, suicide rates in adolescents. So those are the limitations of, the, of these surveys. So um, what is it about U.S.-born, what are the statistics between U.S.-born Latinos versus immigrant Latinos? So uh, immigrant Latinos are this, um, U.S.-born Latinos are the second generation youth um, that show that there was 2.87% more uh, times more likely to attempt suicide, 2.27 times more likely to engage in problematic alcohol use, um, 2.56 times more likely to engage in repeated marijuana, marijuana use, and 2.28 times uh, more likely to engage in repeated other drug use than there were their foreign-born counterparts or the first-generation youth. So why is that, right? Because they're born here. It's, um, you know, I guess I would think that it would be harder coming into a country than being born in a country since you've gone to school all your life, you understand the language, you kind of get the culture versus coming in from a different culture and trying to assimilate, I think would be harder. But apparently, according to this, it, it's not. It's the opposite. 
So research has shown that adolescent Latina females have much higher rates of suicidal behavior as compared to female peers across ethnocultural groups with relative similar psychopathology. Yet research, researchers know very little about the attempts, their antecedents, and why the girls attempt suicide. A few small studies have focused on Latinas, but none have explored why suicide attempt rates are higher. So what is it about living in the US that may place Latinos at risk for psychological disorders and suicide behaviors? Well, little is known comes from anecdotal descriptions, not empirical explorations of so sociocultural dynamics. Before uncovering intra-ethnic explorations of this phenomenon, it is difficult to understand, before we uncover this intra-ethnic explanations that we need to do, it, is, it would be difficult to understand inter-ethnic differences. So Zayas et al., uh, he's, a, um, he's a PhD from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Washington University. Uh, he presented a conceptual model in 2005 that attempted to integrate the subjective experiences of teenage Latinas uh, uh, using uh, psychological, family, and socioculture experiences related, related to the attempts and why the attempts become the chosen response. So these are pretty, like, um, uh, pretty hard things to, to sort of address um, because they're pretty rooted within the culture. So. Um, one of them is culture and, uh, culture and cultural traditions that influence emotional and behavioral problems of youth, associated, associated symptomology, and risk factors. So one of them is f familism. So what is familism? It's the centrality of the family in the institutional structure of Latin American societies and the influential role of the family individual's life and behavior. It emphasizes maintenance of family cohesion, obligation, and intense attachment to relatives and the family, uh, and the family takes precedence over an individual's needs, thus fostering interdependence within the family. Of note, this can also be a protective factor in addition to a risk factor. Um, cultural family traditions uh, uh, socialize Latina females to be passive, demure, and hyper-responsible for family obligations, unity, and harmony. A girl's perception of causing a disruption in family integrity may be a catalyst for her suicide attempt. Um, another one could be bicultural stress, which is pressure from home to preserve ethnic culture and social pressure to engage in culture of origin. This creates stress from trying to manage demands of both cultures with stressors that include the need to learn many languages and conflict and gaps between generations in the family. Although Latina girls that are matched for the uh, acculturation and generational status do not attempt suicide even with similar mental health complexities. It is possible that the level of acculturative discrepancy between daughters, which are undergoing adolescent development and rapidly acculturating, and parents who are less acculturated and more traditional may be mediated by parents' flexibility or rigidity in their interactions with the girl. So there is hope that bicultural stress can be alleviated, alleviated with um, parents uh, being understanding of what is going on with their child and understanding the push and pull between both cultures. So um, family functioning is another um, uh, uh, part of, of why, we, uh, why we believe that uh, suicide attempts are, are occurring. So fam familialism may influence how the adolescent girl and parents respond to psychosocial stressors but dysfunctional families are likely more challenged than well-functioning families. Due to the traditional structure of Latino females, the emphasis on restrictive authoritarian par parenting, more so for girls, affects the family's capacity to respond flexib flexibly during a crucial period of de development between finding autonomy and maintaining familialism with the family, which includes managing traditional beliefs, uh, values, and biculturalism. And I think I could relate to that. Definitely there is a discrepancy between how uh, young women are treated and expectations of those of females versus what the role of a male is. So in, in Spanish that's called, for the women, it's called marianismo, and in males it's called machismo. Um, and then we have adolescent development. Given the difficulty in managing autonomy with familialism, a central antecedent to suicidal behavior is interpersonal difficulties, such as a romantic relation breakup, which is the exertion of autonomy, and or arguments with parents, which is maintaining familialism. Suicidal behavior in Latina youth usually involves ingestion of pills. Although the medical community will call this a suicide attempt, Latina youth describe it as an impulsive temporary escape from stress. Most have no thought of death, 
This description is similar to the culture-bound syndrome that is more common with adult women known as ataque de nervios. I'm sure you've probably heard of that. It's probably been on the pride exam. Who knows? And so, and so what is ataque de nervios? It's fainting, crying, trembling, screaming, becoming aggressive, sense of loss of control that usually comes up after a direct result of stressful events relating to the family. She perceives a threat to the integrity of the family, which is similar to why Latina females are ingesting pills. There's a threat to their, their behavior is threatening their integral uh, support system, which is their family. Another component to suicide is related, relatedness, which is known as mutuality of the girl with her parents. So it's basically saying, how much does my parent understand me and the presence of supportive mentors? So if that, if that understanding isn't present, then the, the potential to having um, more uh, distress is present. That understanding helps mitigate some of that distress that the person is experiencing through the biculturalism. It appears that, that those that attempted suicide perceived much lower mutuality with their mother, had a less flexible and adaptive family, and more periods of absent fathers than non-attempters. So, this is, kind of, so the, this is the model that he developed. Those were the family, social, cultural environments that, that Zayas believes, believes that are um, affecting the ultimate suicide attempt. But in that process, there's also, also emotional vulnerability and psychosocial functioning. And so Zayas defines emotional vulnerability as the sensitivity to existential threat, perceived or real, that influences the way a girl engages with the world perceptions of tensions and conflicts in her social milieu, and the response to stress or difficulty, including how she handles critical family situations. Psychosocial functioning is described as a mastery of socially acceptable coping strategies. It is found that suicidal Latina youth often use wishful thinking, social withdrawal, and blaming others to cope. Suicide attempt may be an act of withdrawal from intense social crisis, similar to the ataque de nervios for older women, and believes that this is a key determinant in, determinant in suicide attempts. So uh, in 2000, Cobus and Reyes uh, published a paper that found that Latina adolescents reported arguments with and between parents and breaking up with someone they were dating as among the most stressful events, more so than conflicts with peers. Um, which is different than uh, their peer groups, um, their white peer groups that tend to have conflict with peers to be one of the major factors of why they end up in the unit. We see that a lot on 7A, uh, bullying and conflict with, um, with their own peer groups. Additionally, maladaptive interactions of parents and adolescents intensifies the conflict and accumulates stress in a family is a factor in suicide attempts generally. So that's that makes sense of why a dysfunctional family, there's cumulative stress, maladaptive behaviors between parents, and thus that's seen in the children as well. Given the nature of the interpersonal stressors, the girls' movement toward greater social autonomy arouses family conflict, a process involving issues of normal adolescent behavior and acculturation. So this disruption in the family over the girls' developing sexuality and greater autonomy is expressed as a prolonged and intense family struggle which makes sense of why we see kids mostly 9 to 12 years old coming in with suicide attempts. So then it's believed that uh, this chain of reactions creates the perfect storm for a suicide attempt which, with kids. And, and so what are the barriers to treatment? Um, so, uh, so what are these barriers before Latina youth attempts suicide? So culture expression of, of um, distress and depression it is important to consider uh, uh, culture expressions of distress because the term nervios refers to a cult which is nerves in Spanish, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned that prior. Uh, refers to a culturally based somatic expression of anxiety or other emotional distress which is differentiated from severe pathology such as schizophrenia, psychotic disorders, or which is also referred to as locura, which is craziness, or file mental, which is a mental defect, um, versus what we consider in DSM-5 to be schizophrenia. So there's always these other words, these other terminologies that can't be what it really is. You know? um, also, cultural competency to the mental health providers. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I mean, that could be a barrier to treatment, but there are some people that believe that that, not, that is not necessarily a barrier of treatment. I think it's, it's kind of controversial. Um, 
uh, Latino youth are less likely to be identified as suicidal. Again, back to um, the symptomology, right? Like, are you feeling sad? Well, no, but my but my stomach hurts all the time. Um, are you having trouble getting out of bed? No, but I have a headache all the time. And so it's more about like symptoms of what's happening because that's how it's expressed in their family. And so that's just mirroring what's occurring within their family. And Latino parents feel blamed for the suicidal behavior. I think it's probably a lot has to do with um, uh, language difficulty, language barriers in which um, they, that might, the interpretation that might not be correct. They might not be using the right words to understand that it's not blaming, but actually more of a constellation of things that are happening. Um, but parents take on this role of like, it must be me. And I think we see that also in other cultures too, where it must be my fault. I must be doing something wrong. And so that causes the parents, um, especially in Latino populations, to not seek treatment at all. Um, they'd rather go to a family member, they'd rather go to their primary, first they go to the family members and they try to get advice through there. And then if that doesn't work, then they go to their primary care provider. But rarely will they ever go to a psychiatrist or a therapist or try to seek out those, those, um, that help because A, they don't know it exists and B, they don't know how to do it or how to manage it, manage through the system. So Latino, so I mentioned Latinos try to solve the problem at home before seeking help. Uh, limited knowledge on how to enter the mental health system, and limited understanding of psychotropic medications. I think there's just no um, understanding or, or um, experience with this. And if there is, we don't talk about it, you know? And so it's like, oh yeah, Tia Maria, she, she was taking something, but she's better now. You know, it's like always sweeping it under the rug, you know, of like what, what, uh, what mental health is or what the symptoms are, or could this be something, even medical uh, issues are, are treated that way, but I think mental health is more taboo. Um, uninsured rates for Latino children also um, are, are high compared to their non-Latino whites and African-American children, so that's also a huge barrier to, um, and that still remains even with Obamacare. I think Latino parents are afraid of, of uh, deportation. A lot of them are immigrants without papers, and so they worry about those things. Um, so research, research has shown that the following to be the following to be among the most significant protective factors in Hispanic populations. So as I mentioned previously, familialism can be a protective factor. It's a uh, youth reported as being a strong, supportive relationships with their parents, and, are, and those that feel that way are less likely to attempt suicide. The other one is ethnic affiliation. Latina adolescents with greater um, with greater involvement in Hispanic culture have more positive relationships with their mothers and fewer withdrawn depressive behaviors and suicide attempts. In addition, in addition, ethnic identity is positively associated with self-esteem among Latino and Latina adolescents and has been shown to moderate the relationship between perceived discrimination and depression. So what can we do differently? So this is for Dr. Gerke. Yes, clinicians, be curious. <laughs> I think that is truly what it is. I, I don't think that... I think being a good um, a good interviewer, you know, asking questions that I mean, it's not that you have to be Latino to understand a Latino. I think it's just um, being able to understand the family dynamics. Um, I think all of us are capable of doing that, and understanding um, what the what the um, um, risk factors are and what the barriers are, and then you can address your questions as such. So uh, focused in-depth interview with, elic with eliciting narratives of the suicide attempts, what are the motivations or perceived causes, internal experiences. Learn about the family sociocultural env environment, their beliefs, their observed traditions, their family functioning, the family crisis that led to the attempt, and name or label the experience, because we call it a suicide attempt, but for, for the young girl, it might not have been a suicide attempt. It might have just been like, I was stressed out. I, you know, I, I don't even remember why I did it. I just did it because I wanted to get away from the moment, you know. But there, but as we noticed from the previous slides, their thoughts of death are not even present. Like they have no thoughts of death. They just wanted to take away the stress that was going on at that moment without dying. Um, and then parent interview, inquire about the meaning of the suicide attempt that, that it had for them, their perceptions of what it meant to be their, what it meant to their daughter, and supplement your clinical evaluation with objective assessments that match cultural features, which I think is difficult. There's few assessments that match um, uh, Hispanic uh, cultural traits. And um, I think this, these things will then strength, strengthen your therapeutic alliance that we know is the mainstay of, of, of that person coming back, that person taking your medication, and it's like the, the door to open up um, a, a, a possible improved life for this person. 
So um, I just wanted to, to show this because I meant, I've been mentioning how you don't have to be Latino to treat Latinos um, or to help Latinos. And so Ishikawa et al. in 2014 showed that when the patient and the PCP are aligned in shared decision making around their wish to help the patient to change and the strategies that uh, they will use to enable that change, and when this alliance occurs in the, con in the context of a strong working alliance bond, the patient would be more likely to engage in the treatment plan, possibly to the, due to the patient believing that the primary care provider is culturally competent, even if they may not be, or to understand or appropriately respond to their needs. But I think it's a fact of being human and understanding and willing to work with the patient rather than being this paternalistic um, provider saying, you got to do this, you got to do that, like coming to, a, coming to a common ground of what will work for this patient. Um, so, when, so what this is showing is when working alliance was added um, to the model, cultural competence, competence no longer showed a significant association with intention to follow up on a referral. So um, I think we have some time to show you a video. Uh, let's see if I can just play it on. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, what this video is, is um, it's not showing you an adolescent with depression, but I think what's more important is that it's showing you risk factors that are present in uh, this population and how this um, risk factors are displayed and how they're ultimately um, affected, how this person is affected by them, and they're out of this person's control. Oh, what happened here? Um, do I have to turn this off? Let's see. Get out of here. Maybe take this. Oh, those are my kids, by the way. <laughs> Let me do this. No. I disconnected this. Oh, I saw. Mm -hmm. it's on this one. The education changes lives. And so I think we need to all be interested in education and quality schools in every neighborhood. We want uh, safe homes, good homes, good jobs, strong families, strong communities, and an opportunity to be the best in life that we can be. Los Angeles, California. A city in the grip of a crisis that's sweeping the nation. All power! All power! 17 year old Cindy Garcia is in the trenches. She's a senior at Fremont High School in South LA. It's almost entirely Latino, and 70% of the students don't graduate on time. I don't want to fall into the 70%. No, I, I know I deserve better than that. It's not going to be easy. Cindy is more than a semester behind, and there's just three months until graduation. What happened your ninth grade year? I, I, I guess I didn't find it important. Like, I didn't care. And Did you I, go? To school? Yeah. No, I would. I would you cut would, every day? Yeah. Every mostly. day? Uh, kind of, yeah. Now she's trying to make up for lost time. But for Cindy, like the children of many Latino immigrants, family often trumps school. Cindy lives in this three bedroom house with her mother, two sisters, baby brother, and a two and a half year old niece. She's constantly pulled out of school to take care of the kids and help out at the family store which barely makes ends meet. Check if there's some more in the back, because I don't think so. Cindy also acts as a translator for her mother, Onelia, who speaks no English. She's been sick and needs help navigating doctor's appointments. Do you ever want to say to her, I need to be in school? Yeah, I do. And do you say that? No. No, why not? Because, because I'm the only one that can help her sometimes, you know? So I'm, I can't, I mean, if it was something else, like, go to the store with me, then okay, but like, it, this is very important, so I can have to be there. It's a lot of responsibility, you're 17. I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Cindy's mother, Onelia, came here from Guatemala at age 15. 
Onelia resents her own mother for holding her back. Porque mi mamá es de las personas que creen que la mujer no estudia, solo los, los hombres. Because my grandma was the kind of person that believes that women shouldn't go to school, only men. I mean, you look at a kid like Cindy Garcia, and you see all the things that she's struggling with, and some of that is Latino culture. Right. Families need to survive. Latino culture is built around families, but I think it can be a strength as well. Who knows? Here we're having the next superintendent, the next teachers, the next board members. Monica Garcia is the board president for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Your education for me, your education, I'm working to get it to be a priority for California. It's the second largest school district in the nation, overwhelmingly Latino, and it's in peril. An Education Week study found that half of its 700,000 students aren't graduating on time. Two students walk in the door that odds are one's not going to make it. Yes, and that's what we're trying to fix. With Latinos on track to be the largest demographic of school-aged children by the year 2050, the high stakes aren't lost on Monica Garcia. The child in our classroom is not the ch same child that was there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I think more than that, our world is changing. And so the school system hasn't changed fast enough to meet the kids of today. Latinos attend the country's most underfunded and overcrowded high schools. And Garfield, just across town from Cindy Garcia's school, is one of them. So this school was built to hold 1,500 students. That's right. How many does it hold now? 4,800 year-round, which means that at least 3,600 kids at one time. Three times the amount it was meant for. Yes, yes. Latinos also attend schools with the highest poverty rates. Nearly half are learning English as a second language. And for many, like Cindy Garcia, working and supporting the family come before school. Steve lived here. Mr. Calleros lived there. Where did you live? Monica Garcia grew up just blocks from Garfield here in East L.A. The daughter of poor Mexican immigrants, she learned English as a second language. I lived here at 759 oh, that's Hofner. This, it's a two-bedroom house, uh, living room. Five very kids in a two-bedroom house. Yeah. Monica's parents stressed education. They scraped together money for Catholic school and sent Monica to college with the help of scholarships and grants. Education was her ticket out of poverty. I used to be poor. I'm not poor anymore. And so for children of poverty, education is that equalizer. And what we have to do is help children not have to choose, do I want to um, support my family or do I want to be in school? It's a tough choice that Cindy Garcia makes every day. She's nearly 40 credits behind, but teachers say she's bright and she's determined to graduate and someday become a social worker. So Cindy's in class from sun up to sundown. <sighs> and on weekends to make it happen. It starts at eight with my first class and it ends at 8.30 with my last class. So it's basically a 12 hour day. Still, nobody believes that Cindy can graduate, including her mother. No sé, porque ella dice que sí. Y a veces pienso que no. She says she doesn't know that. I tell her yes, but that sometimes she doubts it. Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaragosa is convinced the future of the nation depends So the end result is Cindy runs into some trouble and um, it's unclear if she's going to graduate high school. I don't know what the trouble is. There's a part two that I can't find. So, so what separates me from, from Cindy? Not much. You know, um, I didn't grow up with a family that uh, went to college, you know, um, barely made it through high school. My dad had to work 
uh, while in high school to support the family. So why didn't I end up like Cindy? You know, and I think for me it was an intact family. Uh, my family, my parents. Um, every day was a question. So what do you? When, where are you going to go to college? Even I can remember since I was a kid. Like, what are you going to do when you grow up? Where are you going to go to college? And so that was instilled in me, and there was no option, you know. But that took a lot of work and effort on my parents' part while they worked multiple job, jobs a day and being raised sometimes on my own, sometimes by my grandparents, depending on how it worked out, you know. So um, so it is a real struggle, and it is, uh, and it is, it's a real fact. And so how, how can we help um, overcome that, and how can we become our, make ourselves more available to help kids in, in, in need? at this time. Yeah. That's that's the end. Thank you. I think we maybe have time for one question. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Oh, and I, I can certainly say my cultural competence has improved thank you. Uh, after having watched that. Uh, I have a question. And, uh, you know, back in the second half of the last century when the U.S. Census Board started counting people based on ethnic or racial background, they created this new category, and I'm sure most people in the audience are aware of this, of Hispanic, mm -hmm. right? So there's white or Caucasian black or African American, Asian and Hispanic, but his, the Hispanic group is really people from 13 or more geographical areas, yep. right? And I, I, was, I was curious what your thoughts are on that. And, and, and just to give you why I asked this question is, there are places in this country where I'll go and say I'm Asian, and people will be like, no, you're not Asian. Man. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I'm curious how much of this phenomenon is really uh, more social mm -hmm. and more tied to, uh, you know, economic class, right? Uh, to what? To your to, class? To, to economic status yes, and class, I believe, yep. right? Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, being uh, like a Hisp Hispanic phenomenon. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And I think um, to sort of add to that, the the social, the socioeconomic class. I mean, most of the immigrants that come to this country um, are people that uh, have limited uh, formal education to begin with. Some of them haven't even graduated elementary school. Uh, most of the people who who have graduated college and beyond rarely uh, need to come to the United States. They're doing very well in their own countries. And so, yes, I do believe that socioeconomic uh, tensions do uh, play a role in this. And also, in, in, in your question about, um, yes, Latinos encompasses lots of different countries. And within that, there's variations of culture. And so there was... Um, like, uh, there was therapy that was done, uh, CBT-based therapy that was done in Miami. And they took uh, Cuban uh, adolescents and non-Cuban adolescents, and the CBT therapy worked with the non-Cuban adolescents, but not with the Cubans. And so that shows you that there's that there's uh, some intricate cultural differences. That why didn't it work? You know, maybe Miami is mostly Cuban. You know, so they have a lot of support system within their own community. That that's something that popped into my head. I'm not sure if that's right or not, but it's definitely there are these these factors of of a different ethnic uh, geography that does play, take part in that. Yeah. Illuminating. Thank you so much. Yeah.